Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Promise Anders show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett. As per usual, we're back to talk about whatever the hell is happening at Manchester United because it's been another week of chaos on the pitch and off the pitch as well. Rob, how are you doing? Not bad, Scott. Not bad, Scott. Like a few days out now from Bournemouth, still recovering from that. Same old, same old. But as you said, the, the Manchester United news doesn't stop, does it? So we're here today to kind of go through everything. Yes, subscribe to the show, please, if you would, on Apple and Spotify. Uh, you can find us, The Promise and a Manchester United podcast, if you just search for us on those apps. Also, YouTube as well, The Promise and a Man United podcast. Please like the video, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell so you never miss a show, etc., etc. You know the drill by now if you're listening for however long you've been listening for. We've been doing this for a long, long time now. It's like we're ending our is it our third season rob i think we we started when ronaldo resigned didn't we it was around was that it, point that, i think it, 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 is it three on youtube years? anyway it was on youtube anyway that was yeah we did stuff before as well didn't we so like I, I remember when we started talking about doing this show that was that felt a long time ago didn't it we first discussed it and then kind of started to do bits and bobs and test bits but uh yes we've been going for a, a long while now and uh hopefully into next season as well Time flies when you're having fun or just an awful football club. <laughs> which just is just following Man United, exactly. Yeah, following Man United <laughs> around. Uh, but you can follow us on social media as well at double underscore Scott Saunders on X, Instagram, TikTok, at underscore Rob underscore B on X and YouTube. And at TPL MUFC on X as well. And obviously YouTube is where you can find us. Uh, Your studio podcast. looking Swiss there, Scott. No, no, it's, not ready, yeah. it's not ready um, It's not ready. It's looking have... good. It's looking, looking good. I like all that padding there at the back. Is that like soundproofing yeah, so no one can hear scott's cry into the abyss when he's talking about Man i don't United. cry i'm apath i'm apathetic to this stuff nowadays we've got a um we've got a studio like directly behind the camera which is really cool and then we've got some logo to the side which is mm. too reflective at the moment to actually put in shots so i'm just having to make do and <laughs> uh, we tried two cameras one camera was flickering quite a bit so we had to change it uh, sorry I've, I've wasted about uh, 25 minutes of your morning time, Rob, as we tried to uh, try to get up to speed today. But yes, uh, we're back to okay. talk today about what are we talking about. Alejandro Garnacho, mm. potentially player of the season, but lots of fallout around him over the last few days. <sighs> Something as innocuous as liking a tweet or two. But obviously that becomes big news when you're a Man United player. So uh, we'll mm -hmm. talk about him, uh, who's right, who's wrong, what's what the hell's going on there. We'll talk about Jim Ratcliffe's potential reaction to it as well, or reported reaction to it. We'll talk about other reports as well from players waiting for a decision on Eric Ten Hag to be made before making a decision on whether they stay at Man United. I have my thoughts on that. Rob has his thoughts on that as well. We'll talk about it later on in the show. And we'll do some transfer talk as well, because obviously this season is effectively over outside of the FA Cup. Uh, United could, well, they play Coventry on Sunday and... I'm not the only one thinking, I'm sure of it, that this could be one of the biggest upsets in Premier League history if uh, United keep giving as many shots away as they're giving away. So we'll see. I'll, I'll be there for that, which is very exciting. Or not. Good uh, luck to you, Scott. Good luck to me. Luck I'm to not me. going because I curse United at Wembley. Every time I'm, I'm at Wembley, either work or watching United, they, they something terrible happens. So I'm staying away. <laughs> United's last visit to Wembley, I think they conceded within 13 seconds in the last yes. FA Cup final. They could also go back to Wembley and play Man City again, who are on the verge of a second consecutive treble, the way things are looking, because they play in the Champions League this week. Yeah. At home to Real Madrid. They play Chelsea in the FA Cup semi-final. They've just gone top of the Premier League as well, because Arsenal and Liverpool bottled it. Or did they? They just mm. lost it. Both lost at home. So uh, I think Chelsea are the form team in the league, aren't they? And I think undefeated in eight. Cole Palmer, best player in, in the world. Actually, you know? Hey. Wow. Cole Cole Palmer, best in. Player in the world, and uh, and and he's playing against his old team at Wembley. Yeah, interesting. Chelsea have given City some problems as well. Uh, yeah. So I think the way that United Chelsea games have been played this season, I think playing on that pitch at Wembley, if that mm. was the game, it would be it'd be entertaining. Whether whether you would enjoy it as a United fan and a Chelsea fan, given the the chaos that you would see on the pitch, probably, you know, as anyone's guess. But United probably have a better chance of beating Chelsea than they do of beating Man City. But yes. you never know. We'll. Uh, We'll cross that bridge if and when we come to it. But to, to start the show today, let's talk. Let's do this Garnacho thing, okay? Yeah. Now, Garnacho, Alejandro Garnacho played thirty consecutive games. Started thirty consecutive games, I believe it is, under Eric Ten Hag, and played at Bournemouth at the weekend on the right side. 
gave the ball away for one of the goals. Uh, and Eric Ten Hag thought that's not working on the right side. So he subbed him off at half time for Ahmad. United went on to draw the game 2-2. Uh, but there were some things that Ten Hag was asked afterwards, which uh, suggested he wasn't happy with Garnacho's performance. And obviously, social media melts down and everyone has their opinion. And uh, Garnacho ended up liking a couple of tweets about him being benched or being taken out or receiving the blame. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's seen this by now, but if you haven't already, maybe Rob, you can, you can pick up from where I left off. Yes. It's something we've seen at Manchester United before, but the truth is it does happen at all football clubs. Like, again, I've seen people tweet out and even reply to some of my stuff and say, why does this only happen at Manchester United? Well, it doesn't. It's just that you hear about it because it's Manchester United. You're not interested if it's a Stoke City player, are you? It's not going to get any traction. No one's going to talk about it. So things with with Garnacho, you know, we've seen that he he uh, he obviously got pulled off in that game. Um, wasn't playing particularly well. Afterwards, the manager didn't reference him directly, but kind of did. Talked about players that weren't doing their job, changing stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think it was anything overly dramatic. Um, and then, of course, there was two tweets put out by Mark Goldbridge from the United Stand uh, where he was critical of uh, the manager making those comments. or you could say they're swipes, I think, in the, in the press conference. But again, I don't think there was anything dramatic. And the player liked those two tweets. I think my position on this, Scott, is that it's, it's difficult, isn't it? We're all on social media. Social media is a massive part of our industry. It's part of our jobs, part of our worlds. Um, but when you're 19, it's just your phone. It's just in your phone. It's just something that you see, and you see lots of stuff and a lot of noise. And sometimes you you respond to it, and you know he liked those two tweets. And I think you said to me, didn't you, before the show, Scott? Like he would have known that it would have got traction. And I'm not 100 percent convinced that an 18 or a 19 year old making an emotional moment or pressing a button does get that. Does understand that there's a load of editors waiting to write stories about it. I just don't know, and a load of people writing tweets. So that's where we are with it. Obviously, I think United are going to handle it internally. I don't think it's a big thing. I really don't. But I do think United, as a club and football in general, needs to educate its players a little bit more around social media, like widely about the use of it, because I think it's out of hand. I don't think it's a good look that you're emotional. You come off football pitch, Scott. The first thing you do is pick up your phone, like. It's bad, really. There should be things in place from the club saying, do you know what? No phones in the dressing room, lads. Now, that might be controversial, but you can do stuff like that and make sure that these things are, maybe you put a lid on them and you actually have standards when it comes to social media. I mean, maybe, do I agree with that? Maybe. You don't have um, to. But yeah, it's a, it's that's the way that the world is nowadays. I agree. Like mm. United need to put some standards in place for behavior on social Hmm. Um, things you say that even like I remember I've been working in like news football football news media for a decade now, and there were a few years ago we would look at like activity like that and think, oh god, how pathetic is it that that is now news? But it yeah. is, <laughs> you know, it it is, and especially in a social media age where you know every single thing, every single transfer rumor, every single player a thing does. Uh, Every single thing a player does is magnified, especially to the point where at United, you know, of course, everything that you do as a Man United player is going to be picked up on because there are media out there that thrive on it. They make money off it. And <clears throat> even now with X, with Twitter, you can pay a subscription fee and make money based on your tweets. So, you know, that is obviously going to have a big spotlight on it. And yeah, I think United should maybe do a better job of educating their players what to do, but also, you know, Garnacho's grown up in that generation. I think it's I think it's a little bit naive to say that he doesn't realise. I think he should realise. If he doesn't, he should learn and United should help him. Hmm. Uh but you know we've we've had this it just sums up Man United in general, doesn't it? We've had at the start of the season Jaden Sancho going out and actually writing something down, defying his manager, left it up for two weeks and then never play for the club again. Whether he does play for the club again remains to be seen. Mm. But just they have to be very, very acutely aware, or they must know maybe they want to send a message in 
in defiance of the manager. I, I don't know what it is, but United need to Excellent. deal with it now. I think I think they have dealt with it. Mm. Whatever's happened internally, they've dealt with it in the right way. I want the matter to be buried and you know dealt with. I think that's the case. Whether he gets dropped remains to be seen. But they've dealt with this the right way. Now, they could have dealt with the Sancho thing the same way. But they obviously, Jaden Sancho made another decision. Garnacho's said to have some, shown some contrition. So it is what it is. Bury it, get rid of the problem, and carry on. But the wider picture should be that no player should be able to go out and defy their manager on social media. Especially if you're a Man United player, I know you says it ha- you say it happens at every club, Rob. But mm. you know the circus it creates around it. The play- the players have to know what club they're playing for, regardless of their age, mm-hmm. and you know it just feeds into the chaos that is Man United. And obviously, Sir Jim Ratcliffe is reported to have learned about the situation and knows what happened and is now himself annoyed that the situation has been blown up into whatever it is that could have quite easily been dealt with if he had not liked those tweets and he had just had a meeting with the manager the next day or after the game simple as that yeah i, I agree with you i look at it from from two angles is that one the professionalism within the game about how clubs work and two as a father of teenage children yeah, and like I, I get that these players at 17, 18, 19, 20 are on incredible money. I think I, I quoted once about when I worked at Arsenal and uh, and there was the youth team were in and it was just a load of Ferraris in the car park. And I was like, what is going on here? Like these are, these are kids with Ferraris. It doesn't feel right. You know, what's going on here? And, and these players who are on the fringe of the first team are in and they're kind of like 21 and they've got incredible amounts of money in their pockets. I think the thing is, Scott, we just totally forget that kids are kids and that they will be kids and they'll act like kids. And I think we've, we've got Nacho. It's a show of petulance, but he's working in a, in a profession where you have to have high mor- high standards of professionalism and morals and you have to be good at it. And the truth is, there is no 19-year-old on this planet that is good at it. You do not have the emotional maturity and think that these things matter so much. So I think especially we live in a generation where everyone's got their phones in their hands 24-7. It's become like blasé. That I don't think anyone, like especially the younger generation, don't really consider much of it. I said this about Jaden Sancho at the time, but it's it's not the first, the first kind of example. Is that United need to get really good at putting this out to their players and making sure their players are 100 percent trained on it. And I know they do social media training now, but Scott, it was only a few weeks or months ago that one of our most senior players and Marcus Rashford's walking around Belfast. Do you think he doesn't think he's going to get photographed? So, like, these things all mesh together for me. They're a bit like, they're, they're sliding scales. I think when you look at it individually, discipline is an issue at Man United. That's that's true. But I also think, like, find the boy a week's wages, slap his wrist, and say, that's it. Or maybe start saying to the players now, we don't want you on your social media accounts liking stuff and all of that. Like, this is, you know, let's get it on a contract, Scott. Let's start getting people signing up and saying, do you know what, your social media is for your branding. It's not for you to let off a little bit of steam. You know, you're a 19-year-old, but you're not 19-year-old from Croydon down the road there or something. You're you're a 19-year-old who plays for Manchester United. You need to represent the club better. So I think Ineos will look at that, and I think they'll sort all that out in the weeks ahead, months ahead. Yeah, I think you mentioned there, sliding scale is perfectly right. Obviously, Sancho and Garnacho situations are, are vastly different, even though Very they different. are they're both on the same social platform, but Jaden mm. Sancho's made a point to go and write something, which is... Uh, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's worse, isn't it? But obviously the contrition that's been showed in the two situations means that obviously, and this is the case, this matter should be buried. We just felt like we had to we had to talk about it and address it because it is uh, something that's happening around United at the moment. It does yeah. summarise really the disciplinary issues that have you know clogged United for the best mm. part of a, a nine, ten years. So... But it started with with Ronaldo, right? Sorry, just to put cap on that as well. It started with Ronaldo thinking that he can go away from his employer, Manchester United, go and sit with Piers Morgan and run his mouth. And when your hero is Cristiano Ronaldo, as it is with Alejandro Granacho, you're probably not going to think that liking a couple of tweets means a lot. (laughs) Probably not, because your hero just went and did that only a couple of years ago. So these things do live and breathe and they kind of evolve. But I think this is where Manchester United's discipline overall needs to improve. And that is going to be a big job for Ineos and the sporting structure 
and the sporting directors because that has to be laid out doesn't it on day one to players whoever they are when they come to the club you represent the badge and when all of this stops because you've only got to blow your nose in public and it's a story at Man United where I said the players do this at Stoke City or down the leagues it happens all the time but it's not interesting. It's not news. It just becomes local news and chip paper quite quickly. So, um, yeah, that's a it's a mistake oh, from Garnacho, yeah. but I'm sure he'll learn from it. And as you said, I, you know, he took the sweets down pretty quickly. So it was just a silly thing, really, rather than I think a huge disrespectful act. Yeah, if you wanted a summary of just how much uh, United players are in focus, I think Jay Motti um, yesterday or the day before put a thread together of all the times the Daily Mail were. Uh, Daily Mail photographers were stalking Man United players as they were out just doing general things. Like Kobe Maynu the other week was pictured in a blue ca- blue jacket. Yeah, <gasps> he's wearing blue. Terrible! Oh my god, Look, I'm wearing bluish today. <gasps> that's that's the not the only one stuff. either. We've had uh, Bruno Fernandez go shopping, or Eric Ten Hag uh, takes How a bike ride they? across town. You know all of this and. <laughs> There was a good one of uh, of Eric Ten Hag in a pub garden, and the person took a picture of the back of his head. <laughs> I said, Eric Ten Hag's in a pub garden. Look, this is terrible, isn't it? It's like he's just having a pint of beer. Like, all right, it's a human being, isn't he? So it, that's football's got. But I also think with Man United, is that you know we 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 pay a lot of people's bills. It's just what it is. So like you're going to get followed around, and and I think when you you are young at a club like United, you need protection. You know, and Fergie was really good at that years ago, making sure you know. And you know what, with Fergie and just referencing that, when David Beckham went the other way and wanted more attention, you know, Fergie was like, "No, nah, we don't do this. We're going to lock it down." And eventually, he went off you go because the club can't do this. So. That's not having a go at Bex, but that's that's how you have to be. And I think you have to encourage your footballers to not be in this social media bubble 24-7 because it will come back to bite you, no doubt about it. Well, that's an example of the standards that Ferguson held, obviously. And obviously, he was in charge of essentially everything within mm. the club. He couldn't do absolutely everything. And other people had jobs uh, overseeing certain things. But obviously, he would be the one that was holding down standards and driving discipline. And if you cross the line he would have the final say and you would leave. And at the moment, Eric Ten Hag is... But there's other managers who've wanted players to leave and they haven't been able to get out. Hmm. Anthony Martial, he's going to leave, but other managers have tried to sell him in the past. Go back to 2017. Jose Mourinho wanted him out. Yeah, He's still there. You know? And yeah, it doesn't have to be the manager. I'm not saying it has to be the manager, but obviously there's a line that you know, you need to define yourself as a football mm. club. Probably everybody needs to buy into it. The players need to be aware of what it is. And if you cross that line, you get fined. Or if you cross it, cross the line, if you're so far past the line, so far past the line, you can't see the line anymore. You're mm. gone. You know, to quote, um, I think that was a friend's quote. But um, <laughs> yeah. anyway, I, I think it should be the I think it should be the sporting director's job. Like that's how I, yeah. I look at it. If yeah, you yeah. run the project, the project's up to you. You you do that. You put stands in place. You put contracts in place. People sign those contracts it's on you. Then and this is the whole thing about coaching. I want coaches to coach. And I think with Eric Ten Hag, one of the big issues for him over the last two years and things have gone wrong is it probably hasn't been given the time to coach enough. Like he's been dealing with so much stuff. So that's just what it is, and he has to balance and deal with that. But I think this will be the reset button this summer is that, you know, United will, will sort the structure up above, sort the standards out. And then the coach, whoever the coach will be, will be expected to put a team out on a pitch that wins football matches, Scott, because we have not won many this year or not as many as we'd want to. 17 defeats, I think now, 17 or 18 in all competitions. So disappointing season. But I think for for Eric, it's hard for him to deal with these things. Like he shouldn't really even deal with the Garnacho thing. That should be done by a HR wing of United. Someone should be ringing him in saying, right, can you come in for a meeting? And, yeah. and scare him and say, right, you've got a week's wages now. Sorry, mate, his official letter and get back to training. That's how businesses work. So I would like United to be a little bit more like that, a bit more savvy. Sir Jim uh, was, as we mentioned, quite miffed with it. I think yeah. it's just, it, it, it's, like, it's encouraging, I guess, that he's seeing the situation for what it is. Hmm. And he's going to be the person, obviously, who is going to put, or his people are going to put in place a structure that will start dealing with it. How long it takes, who knows? Hopefully they can do it within a summer and do a big shift o- over this summer, but I think it'll take a couple of seasons, really. I think yeah. discipline, you can get done quickly, Scott, because, in, again, I always say the words tonight in any business. Again, it's my experiences. You, you go there, you lay the law down, you say, this is wrong and this isn't working. 
this is how we're going to do it. And if you do it like that, you're gone. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to blink. I'm not going to be like, sorry, you got to pay your bills. It'll be like, this is the institution. The institution runs like this, and this is what we're going to do. So I think they can press that reset in the summer, Scott. Bring in some new players. Get rid of some players. Might have a new coach. You might not but you've got to put the standards in and it's got to be official. And I think with United, it hasn't been for years. There's been no officialdom at the top. It's been like, who runs this football club? And the truth is, no one's run it. That's been the issue. You know, you shouldn't leave it to managers to have to deal with everything like maybe Fergie once did and wanted to do. So, yeah, I think I think you can do that really quickly in any business because if a business is failing, it's easy to say to the staff, it's failing because of these things. So you're not doing them anymore. And if you carry on doing them, you will not be at the football club. I, that's not a reference to Garnacho. That's a reference more to the senior players, really, and the staff at Man United. Now, this maybe ties in a little bit to reports that we saw earlier this week again of... Well, I tweeted about this, actually. It's from the Manchester Evening News. Some players are waiting for a decision on the manager to decide whether they will stay or leave and whether they want to stay or leave. Um, right. How do you feel about that? Shall I go first or do you want to go first? You go first, Scott, this time. You go first. That happens at every club, definitely. I understand that. But if that doesn't summarize the problems, again, that United have had for the last decade, it's I can wait out this manager because, mm. you know, or maybe I can down tools. Or may, I'm not accusing them of doing it this time, but maybe I, I could give 80% effort instead of 100. Uh, and hopefully this manager goes and I can we can employ somebody that I like next time. That is not the attitude to have. You should be honoured to wear this football club shirt. You should be honoured to wear the badge. And no matter who the manager is, you should be giving absolutely everything you have every single day in order to get in the team. And if you're not in the team, respect the decision, work hard to get in the team. That is simple enough. That That is how it should be. And that is not the case at the moment. There's a ton of players in that team that are probably in that situation. I'm not going to name names, but I'm sure you can take, well, maybe name one. Jaden Sancho, the, the, the situation might change for him if Eric Ten Hag leaves, because obviously we know that they've fallen out and that's beyond repair already. There's mm -hmm. probably other players in the dressing room that are feeling the same way. But generally, you can't tolerate that attitude from players, if you are Ineos, if you're Jim Ratcliffe, if you're Dave Brailsford, if you're Dan Ashworth, you cannot tolerate that. It should be you work your damnedest every single day to get in the team, no mm -hmm. matter who the manager is. If you don't like the methods, fine. Have a word privately and try and change it. Try and work on it. But you have to be patient. If you're not good enough, you're not good enough and you've got to go. That's, that's, that's the standard. That's it. I'm sorry. And if they continue cater into players and then oh there's a there's another manager in now i'm gonna give my all for him oh wait six months in i don't like what you just said to me mm. so i'm gonna i'm gonna scale off a little bit and i'm gonna wait for the next guy that has been the problem this entire time you can't tolerate that anymore yeah look, i completely agree with you and what, just to add on to that what i my kind of opinion on it is that that i still do believe again that this that this overall thing about players not being happy waiting for managers to leave and all of this when you look at a, a, a system in English Premier League where I think the average manager stays 18 months at a club, I think it is 18 or months or two years, is that that is actually a mindset in football, is that players always are convinced they'll outlive managers. Now, at Man United, Scott, that's been acute because United have been such a dysfunctional mess. And that has definitely been a vibe at United and probably still is behind the scenes. But you're totally right. That's not how it should be. But again, that culture comes from above. It comes from the board. It trickles down. It doesn't come from a manager. It doesn't. The manager is just another member of staff that works with the players. They're all as important as each other, or you could say not as important as each other. Nobody should feel big enough to think that they can just sit on their wages and not perform. You shouldn't be like that in any business again, but football does have these things. So I just think with the, uh, you know, we go like you just said there, let's not name names. Well, we won't name names, but there's plenty of players that you can look at this season and go, well, you've not performed to your level this year. I would like to know why. What is it? How do you feel about it? Tell us why you feel like that. And I think we can kind of all like, assume and summarize a lot of these things about why some players have not played so well this year so you deal with those players scott and you get rid you don't worry about it it's just you, you look at the player straight in the eye and you go you've not hit our standards our standards are this this is where the standards are always going to be even when we lose the standard is here it's always going to be up here if you do not adhere to that 
goodbye. It doesn't matter whether you're loved or liked or whatever. Like, you know, use Jaden Sancho there as an example. I think Jaden's just a microcosm of Manchester United. He's not, he's just one person. And he, and it was going on long before Jaden. And it will go on long after Jaden if you don't correct it. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's a, I, I think it's natural. Like Dwight York once said very, very publicly that when Sir Alex Ferguson resigned for the very first time and said he was leaving, that basically the whole squad clocked off, including him. He said, and then when Fergie said, I'm staying, he said they all got a shock because they were like, oh, we all realised we clocked off. Now, that was a team that won the treble, Scott. Right. So that was a treble winning squad that kind of down tools for a little bit. So it does happen. Add on to that. Look at Liverpool now, Scott, just edging away. Yeah. Managers going out the door. There will be a change in vibe there. Suddenly not winning games, not playing well. Why? People will be like, oh, well, it's just football. No, it's all very delicate. You see, people just sometimes can't raise themselves because the culture just skews a little bit. And at Man United, it's really skewed, but at Liverpool, you know there's going to be a new manager coming in next next month or two. Do you know what I mean? So these things do affect every football club. It's just that Man United, it just seems more dramatic and more like an episode of EastEnders. I'll tell you what, there was um, Gary Neville interviewed Trent Alexander-Arnold and uh, that came yeah. out on Tuesday morning. Right. Really good, actually, because uh, you get to see that Trent is actually a massive fanboy of that 08 United team. Right. Uh, I don't you, you haven't seen it yet, have you? Not seen it properly, no, no, Not no. Not seen no. it yet. I, I watched it this morning. And you see that Gary Neville asked him if you could invite people to dinner, hmm. three people to dinner, who would you pick? And he picked Steven Gerrard, I think it's Nan and Cristiano Ronaldo. Right. So quite interesting. He asked Gary Neville questions about what that team was like to play in, mm -hmm. about Wayne Rooney and Ronaldo and how the standard between them changed when Rooney came in and stayed at a certain level and obviously was an amazing player for United. But Ronaldo's story was different. He came in scrawny over one summer bulked up yeah. and you know and then went on to amazing heights surpassing Rooney obviously but the other thing that Trent said that really stuck out to me was pre-seasons at Liverpool and how Jurgen Klopp will every day come in and repeat the same message at Liverpool about effort and he said that Jurgen Klopp does not want that Liverpool team to be the best footballing team in the world. He wants them to be the hardest team to beat in the world. And that means effort. That means energy. That means absolutely everything that you're giving every single day. And most, every United fan can like, unless you're that biased, you can look at Liverpool over the last few years and just soundly admit that the style of football at Liverpool and the standards at Liverpool have been massively higher of course. than at United. Regardless of the fact that Jurgen Klopp's won one Premier League and almost as many trophies as Man United managers during their worst period. You can make that mm. argument, obviously, but Liverpool have been, under Jurgen Klopp, run fantastically well. And the attitude of that team summarises uh, and is the reason for their success. Because there's players in there that maybe aren't the most technically gifted, but you see maximum effort levels all the time. And obviously that can only go on for so long. But... Eric Ten Hag is trying to install that attitude in these players. Some of them can't do it. Some of them won't do it. But doesn't that underpin everything? You know? Completely, completely. And I, and I actually think that that simple point is the definition between the, that thin line between success and failure. Like, again, I always say, there's very few teams every season that are successful. They might, you know, get one champion, you might win a cup, someone might do well in the league. But then there's kind of 15 teams after that that don't do a lot or maybe you know, might be happy with their season, but haven't actually achieved much. Man United have definitely fallen into that lesser bracket quite often in the last 10 years. But I think that whole ethos around hard work, again, making that correlation between business and football, is that that is how it is. Successful businesses, people can have bad days, Scott. People can, people can, you know, feel emotional one day, but the whole thing is you've got to be consistent. You have to be consistently good. If you're not consistently good, you get pulled up and you finish. That's it. And that's the way it works. And you're always, that's always in your head. And I think with football, it's a bit more laissez faire sometimes, especially at Man United, where we're a glamour club. So it's a bit like, well, you're here to sell shirts and be glamorous. No, you're here to work hard, work really hard. And then that work turns into results. And I think they said there about Jurgen Klopp. I was, I think I said it a few weeks ago about Liverpool as well, about the season that they've had. And I think, you know, obviously they've had a really good season. But announcing his 
that he was leaving, I said at that point, I said that could really affect them in the running because there's, you've only got to lose one or two in that. If you've got like 15, 16 pushing towards you, but maybe that turns to 12 for any reason, that can lose you a title. And, and I've seen it before. It happens, it's happened at United. It's happened at every other club. The club, it's not happening at Scott. At the moment, just today, is Man City. It's not happening at Man City. City are pulling in the right direction, even though you could say some of their best players are not playing great. And people are talking about Haaland not having a great, great end to the campaign. Um, that's the balancing point. And I think that's whatever happens next season with Ineos and with a new coach or not a new coach, that has to be the that has to be the philosophy. You have to go in and say, right, you work hard every day. And there's none of this kind of rubbish around the club. It's got to be focused. And if you're focused, guess what? You will start winning more games again. It is. It's just how it goes. And that's what Fergie it took Fergie four years, Scott, right? And I know no new manager will have four years. But Fergie had to get rid of a drinking culture at Man United. That took two years. Then he had to get rid of the rubbish squad players. And then even then he brought through kids, but not like the kids from 92. It was like the first class, the Lee Sharps and the Ryan Giggs. And he found a way to become competitive. United need to do that in a quicker manner. That's why I keep saying it's five years to get to the promised land again, because it takes time that's to get there. That's where the name there. comes from. That's where it comes from. But that's that's the whole point of this, the project. That's why we also call it Project Scott, because there are beginnings and ends to projects. And the end to the project is becoming united again. That's the project. Become the most feared team in England again. That's the end of the project. The start of the project was weeks and months ago, like ages ago, when Ineos first put their first bid in and said, we want to take this club. So... I have some faith in that, Scott. Like, I actually do think the standards will improve at Man United, whoever the coach is. And, and that's why also I'm not too high and not too low about who is the coach next year because I don't think it's the most important thing. Good coaches are good coaches. They help you push on, but they're, they're, they're somewhere down the line in terms of standards. The standards must come from above. And then you can kind of build and bring in football football players that, that do that for you. Let's be honest, Man United haven't done that, have they? You know, they gave the keys to Ronaldo to the kingdom and he ruined all that in that period of time. And that, you know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said what he said only a few weeks ago about, you know, he made that choice but wouldn't make that choice again. So um, lessons are learned there, aren't they? And you need to take those lessons and take it on the chin and move forward. It's all about creating a culture that will make everybody within that culture perform at their best, whether that's a coach, whether that's, that's a player. And yeah. United just simply haven't had that yeah. for a long time. They just have Sustainability. Had yeah. And uh, just a quick word, Rob, on the Bournemouth game, because it's four days ago now, but mm. same old stuff. Um, you know, I can't swear, you know, can I? Yeah. Uh, it's, I'm not, not going to. I mark this not for kids on YouTube, so I, I, I don't know about the, the audio thing but no, no, you know, because I don't worry I won't swear you can you can just imagine what I'm going to say <laughs> well we've been saying it for a, an entire year yeah um my, my my different question to you is it like, I know what you think about Ten Hag in terms mm -hmm. of whether he will stay mm -hmm. uh but do you think uh do you think that if he gets another year we will see the same style of play with different players or do you think he will make tweaks to make United not so open because I think what we what we see in United at the moment this is what it's going to be like for the rest of the season there's six games left possibly se uh, seven games left six in the league uh, one in the FA Cup plus another one in the FA Cup potentially if they get through to the final mm. so that's seven eight games left things aren't going to change really and I know you said you wanted to swear at the Bournemouth thing I just looked at it and I was like, I've seen this all before. It doesn't shock me. It's it's mad. It's mad. It doesn't shock me though. So I'm not going to go and like lose my rag over it because this is what we've had all season long, and this is what we're going to get for the rest of the season. Now, I do think though at the same time that if Ten Hag gets players that are capable of doing what he wants with the energy that he wants to he wants his players to have, maybe you see a better version of United with this tactic. Whether it works remains to be seen. But, you know, what, what your takeaway from that? And do you think if Ten Hag gets another year, he'll do it the same way? Look, yeah, I wasn't angry at all about the Bournemouth result and the game itself because, like you, it's just exactly the same thing. We all, This is Groundhog Day for 12 months. This has been the same Man United performance since they won the League Cup and all the way through pre-season into now. This is this is how it goes. Um I think you know we we kind of we just kind of sat on that 
cliche for a bit that, oh, if we had better players, we would be X, Y, or Z. Yes, that is very true. If you have better players, you expect to be better. But just talk there. It was just a whole monologue, didn't we, about standards, yeah? I just I hold Eric Ten Hag to the same standards I hold the players and everyone at the football club. That's all, that's all I care about. You hit the standard. You just said about tactics, would we be saying the same thing? I kind of think we would be. I don't actually think he's going to miraculously change what he thinks wins in the Premier League because even with the injuries and even with the problems this year, Scott, he still could have done that. Still could have played a style of football that protected Man United and didn't make Man United become the worst team statistically for shots against them in Europe. That is a horrific stack that I've never, ever heard Man United get close to, ever, Scott. Like, we're the worst team in Europe for it. So... Yeah. Worst team in the Premier League now. Worst, worse than Luton. Worse than the guys at the, in the in the in the relegation zone. We are a team that doesn't defend. We have no defensive ethics. We have no idea about what to do with the ball in the defensive zones. We are a problem, and I think that that is a, that comes down not just to quality of players, but also to the quality of the tactics. You've got to have tactics that protect you to make sure that you're doing certain things. I think with Eric, he just got to a point where he's just like, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to carry on doing it. I'm not doing anything else. You know, I'm not going to go park buses and all of those things. It's not what I want to do. I want to do this one, play attacking football. Well, I think we've seen this year, Scott, that you cannot have one without the other. You cannot be a team that just attacks and just does pretends defence doesn't exist. Yeah, no top team does that. Again, let's reference Liverpool and Arsenal maybe in the last week or two. You have a bad game of football, Scott, and defensively you don't do it. Guess what? You get beaten. And Man United have got beaten a lot this year. And that's what happens in football. The team normally with the best defence wins stuff. So I think that Eric hasn't, you know, he's, he's had a lot of injuries and that's absolutely a valid reason for, for results. But start a play, Scott, and tactics. If he'd done the right things in these last few months, I would be on a completely different wavelength with him. I'd be like, let's just go into next year and carry it on and see if we can keep going. Do I want to see what we're seeing now, next year, in any capacity? 4-1-4-1, mad counter-pressing, blah, I don't even know what they're doing half the time. Absolutely not. No. And, and I absolutely believe that's ex what Dan Ashworth will be thinking. Dan Ashworth will be thinking, we cannot do this next year. Because if we do this the next first six games of the season, we'll probably lose three of those. And then we're done. Like We're cooked already. We can't do that. So the preseason must be a prelude, Scott, to the better stuff to come next year. It cannot be a re repetition of the bad stuff that we've seen this season. I'm just playing devil's advocate here, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, Tottenham they have been praised for having an amazing season, right? Yep. They just lost 4-0 to Newcastle. There's Hammered. problems in Tottenham system that yeah. everybody can see. Will mm. Ange change? No, nope. he's not going to change. But Tottenham fans are happy with it. When Pep Guardiola took over at Man City, he got canned in his first season because yeah. of the way that they were playing football, right? It looked it looked like they were, you know, I, I don't know how I can say this, but it did not look good. And people were canning Pep Guardiola for it, calling him, this football can't work in the Premier League. It can't work. What did he do? Bought a new fullbacks, bought a new yeah. goalkeeper, got new centre-backs. All of a sudden, it clicks for Man City. I'm not comparing Ten Hag in any sense to that, but I'm saying with other managers, we tolerate the fact that they want to play football a certain way. And Tottenham are 10 points ahead of United. Yeah, okay, they're they might qualify for the Champions League. They probably will get fifth now, by the way, and that might not get Champions League. But every Tottenham fan will go, yeah, he's, he's onto something, though. We just need to do this, do this, do this. But there's tactical flaws in that team. Mm. If, if, if Newcastle played them for 20 minutes or whatever, and we figure they can figure out how to get around this Tottenham team in-game, they lose 4-0. And that's not mm. the first time they've been smashed this season either, Tottenham. That's but right. everybody will look at it and go, oh, nah, give him some time. He knows what he's onto. I know that the fact that United's statistics look so terrible, but th the point I'm trying to make is Ten Hag has a tactical idea that he doesn't have the players for. Mm. We have seen other managers get a pass for it, or we've seen other manage get, managers get criticized for it in the past. Mm. They've addressed the situations with the players that need to be addressed. And Pep Guardiola has gone on to become one of the greatest Premier League coaches we have ever seen. He's, he's second after Ferguson. Mm hmm. So, what's the middle ground? The middle because ground is Pep, yeah. Pep's never changing his way. He's no, obviously middle... evolved it to get big players in his team. 
Mm -hmm. And that's been a natural progression over the course. But Pep has an ideal of ideal way of playing football. Yeah, the, the middle ground is this, is that first and foremost, at Manchester United, you're not allowed to lose. That's just the bottom dollar. You're not allowed to lose. So even when you lose and play well, you're still going to get it on the chin. It's just the way it is. But more than that, Scott, is in kind of comparing those three managers in those clubs, I think it's a good it's a good comparison you make, is that Spurs are nobody. Sorry, Tottenham fans. You're nobodies, yeah? You're in a post-Harry Kane environment and you're being entertained by this manager and you're happy. And you know what your league position is probably about where you should be around that five Fighting for that, num fighting for those numbers. So, so to me, I don't look at that as anything. You, let's use Guardiola now as the example. Guardiola, year one, played with inverted fullbacks. Sanya and cliche. It looked like a hot mess. He said to his people behind the scenes, "I need new fullbacks." So they went and spent a hundred million pound on new fullbacks. Now, City can do that. What we've seen with Guardiola is that Guardiola was right. Guardiola's won everything since then. Treble last year might even be a treble this season. That would be a disaster for all of us who have an emotional attachment to that and don't want to see it. But overall, Guardiola's proved himself. With Ten Hag, he is not proving any way, shape or form that this tactic that he employs has legs. Yeah, what he's saying and what the numbers show, like you said there, it looks really bad on the numbers. And it looks really bad because it is bad. We're watching it. It looks bad. It tastes bad. It smells bad. I can hear it. it. It sounds bad. It's all bad. There's nothing in the tactic that you look at and you go, yeah, you just need to change the players. You just need to get better players in those positions. Now, I think what we need to see Man United be, Scott, next year is a serious football team. That's what we need. We need balance. We need tactics. We need broad tactics. You need to be able to defend and attack. We're going to talk in a minute about a player that might help you do a little bit of both, you know, in terms of you going forward and maybe next season when you're you're doing different things. I think you see it, United. The squad is still dysfunctional, Scott, but what they need is grounding. They need to be able to do basics. And I don't see Eric Ten Hag in two years has given that to his team. And that's a shame. I wanted him to do that because as the coach, I thought we were hiring someone who had this broad palette of tactics. And someone said to me the other day from Ajax on that background, and they said to me, if you ever thought Eric Ten Hag could, could coach team defensively, you didn't watch Ajax enough. That's an Ajax fan. So... That's, I think, the feeling here is that Eric has come in and in two years, his summary is, I must attack more to win games. Well, I'm sorry, you're not going to win every game 5-4. You know, you need to be boring sometimes and win 1-0. And, and he hasn't got that. And I don't see that changing. He, we know, don't we, Scott? United are not going to make wholesale, wholesale changes through, through the summer. They're not going to make £500 million of transfers, which is what you would need in one summer to maybe be able to do this successfully. So you're not doing that. But you will bring in players. You will lose players. You don't but necessarily think, need £500 million. But I think if you're going to play what something you radical, you like you use Guardiola as the example there, but City radically overhauled that squad over a year or two to get it more Guardiola-like. Yeah, that's what they did do. That was the truth. So Guardiola demanded that and he got what he needed. It was Barcelona people behind the scenes at City, still is, and he got what he wanted. Ten Hag's not getting what he wants at uh, uh, Ineos. Ineos are going to give him what they think. And they're going to say, well, first of all, you can't be the worst defensive team in Europe. Like, that's mad. You need to be able to defend Eric. And Eric's saying, well, this is what I want to do. 4 one 4 one I do it every week. That will get you to sack quite quickly. And that's the problem here. You're going to see uh, United Coventry aren't you, at Wembley? And if you lose that game, that is probably the end, isn't it? Because you're hanging on by a thread here. You've I just want to see... that's like... the end after every defeat for the last... You no, know, it feels like it, so... but it, it it does feel like that, doesn't it? You feel like, the, you, you know, you look at the Bournemouth game, Scott, without going too deeply into that. Bournemouth outworked you and outdid you in every position, tactically, offensively, defensively. You were very lucky to be in that game at one point. Bournemouth were hammering you and they had 20 shots on you. I don't like that. I'm not into it, Scott. I'm not, I, I don't want to go everywhere and get 20, 25 shots against you every single game. And he hasn't worked that out in a year. And that's sad. I'm, I'm you know, I feel sad about that. I would, I would have thought that, that he could have actually put together a, a tactic to protect his defense. But United are, are statistically the worst team in Europe for it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, my point on that was managers have ideals, right? Everybody Do you think came he's working to an ideal. Do you think he's working to an ideal or do you think this is I what think he thinks he's works? He's working to an ideal of the way that he wants to play football. You can say that this is never going to work. I, I mm. understand that. But yeah. I'm also saying that the players that he is using, mm. Cas like the Casemiro position. I know, I get that. <laughs> like, that's a hole. Don't blame <laughs> I'm, them. I'm sorry. 
play someone else there. If you oh, replace Christian anyone Eric. who can run, like literally. Or Scott McTominay, who doesn't have position. Scott, no, no, don't play Scott. Play Scott in the eight and play Cobby in the, in, the, in the six. You don't need to play Cobby up the top just because I want him to play as the eight or you want him to play as the eight. You're the manager. Make the decision. Protect the team first. So there's lots of things that he still could have done, even with the injuries. And, and we haven't seen that. He's very conservative in how he changes stuff. He just does it like, you know, by numbers and whatever. And yeah, Casemiro got absolutely like smashed in that game. But do you know what? Is it's, that the first time? No, it's, it's every so game weird watching, watching him run. <laughs> what did I call him? 80 year old Dana in, in midfield. Yeah. And I believe that he's like an old, he's like an old, old man in there. Like what are you doing? So I don't blame him though, because he, that's what he is. So don't play him. That's just as simple as that. Be ruthless. Play a kid in there that can do it if you want to do those things and have tactics that everyone understands, Scott, that we watch and we go, we know what this team wants to do. Instead, we're seeing dysfunction. That's what I feel like chaos football, isn't it? That's all it is. And there's no way of getting around that unless you change the tactics. So if that's his ideal, Scott. Done. That's it. Everyone I don't think they are his Pep. ideals. Everyone said about Pep. Yeah, and then say I'm not I'm not down they with did. that. I, 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 I think the thing is that, that Pep Guardiola had a body of work beforehand that showed that he, if he so got did Eric Ten Hag, maybe not at the same level, but so did yeah. Eric Ten Hag. Yeah, but but Man City, I'm, we're I'm never not this bad. Defending him, by the way, I'm not saying that he yeah. should stay. I'm just saying I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, I'm I asking a question. I'm asking a question. Yeah, I, so. I think Guardiola's team, yeah, needed work and needed change, and they did that, and they, they changed fundamentally. But they put a ton of money into that. But we won't see it, Man United, this summer. But I think the whole thing is that I don't also think that this is Eric Ten Hag's style. Like we did do the work before he came to United and looked to what he did. Play four two three one Scott for years. He didn't do it at United anymore. So like, why why are you gone the four one four one route with an isolated pivot? You know, we want to know the answer to these questions, but we don't know what they are because Eric just says I do this every week. And that's what I'm doing. It's like okay, fair enough. He doesn't explain it in pressers. So there you go. And I think with Guardiola, that you could give Guardiola time because he'd won everything at Bayern Munich, won everything at Barcelona, and you could say, yeah, he's a, he's a generational coach. Let's give him time. I don't think Eric's got that acumen. You know, what's what it's Champions League semi final once, one League Cup, Dutch titles, that's it. Need more. We need to see more now. And the next six games, I still think are an audition for him, Scott. He's, if he could show that he could get the tactics right, then great. But I don't feel it. <laughs> I don't feel that we're going to see anything different. We'll just see what we're seeing at the moment. That's why Bournemouth was just Bournemouth. They're better than us, Scott. Bournemouth are a better team than Man United with, with better fundamentals and better coaching. That's sad. I know if you listen to this, you probably irate at me for defending. No, I'm not defending him. I don't think you're no, Scott. I think there's a few people that agree with you. I think lots of people agree I'm, with you. I'm just asking the question, right? And as as it stands, I don't think Ten Hag will be here next season. Hmm. But you know, I I'm still undecided. <laughs> you know, I, I know I said the other day that like I, I think he'll leave, and I, I tweeted the other day this is the end for Ten Hag because I think it is like that. Hmm. That there's a lot of end of days feels to like. The yeah. press conference, whether he walked out of it or he didn't, you know, at the end, all of the he didn't just to he put didn't, a record. He didn't. He did. It was that was bad editorial, and he also they said it was the last question beforehand. So that's why he walked out. So he knew that, that's the question. power of like social media. As we exactly. came to that, that is what everybody sees. You can cut yeah. it before you can cut yeah. the clip before uh, the press officer says that's the end of the press conference, and yeah. you can just look at that. You can look at his forlorn face, happens. and you can hear the question, which is an awful question to ask. You know, when he's walking out, oh, this could be the worst league finish you've ever had, yeah. and. Yeah, potentially. I'm on board with that, by the way. That should if, be question like number come, one. If I come ninth, honestly, <laughs> if I come ninth, that gives a great chance to reset yeah. everything to me. A yes, you'll be struggling for money, but oh, actually, you might have to raise it in different ways. You yeah. might have to sell some players that need to go anyway. Exactly. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. And You're 16 points Europe, behind Aston Villa. You're 16 points behind Aston Villa, right? That's, you cannot be that. That cannot happen in any Man United universe, or certainly as it is at the moment. Right, let's move on anyway. Uh, let, let us know your thoughts on that. Get in the comments. Uh, I was playing devil's advocate there. I'm not not completely in defense there. I cannot defend it. I'm no. just asking the question. It All would right? have been a good example. Do you know you said you, uh, Guardiola? I think Klopp would have been a better example because year one, Liverpool were terrible. And then year two, they weren't much better. And Klopp wanted to play this heavy metal style of football. You know, that's his thing. And and it, it looked mad. Like, that's why they kept... Did they come eighth first year? Mm. You know, so that's kind of similar to United, similar to this. Arsenal came eighth twice as well. 
Exactly. So, so I think you know there are examples there. And about... Jurgen Klopp has never beaten Eriksen Hag at Old Trafford. There you go. And and I do actually think United's four three and the two two against them have knocked the stuffing out of Liverpool. It's been a punch in the gut, and they haven't That's been able the to trophy for the season. Unless we win the FA Cup, <laughs> you know that's it's, it's um it's funny isn't it how things work out because I do think now with, with Klopp he, there's a thin line now between will his last season look like a success or not because I think if they blow up now at the end of this season it won't be the first time a Klopp team has blown up at the end of at the, the end of a the competition. absolute irony Rob that Liverpool could finish third and win the Carabao Cup which there is exactly what Eric Ten Hag did last season and got it. for it. There we go. And anyway, <laughs> right, let's let's move on to uh in out, right? Shake it all you about. Talk to me about uh, Jeremy Frimpong just won mm. the league with uh with Bayer Leverkusen over the weekend. Yeah. Release clause in his contract been linked with Man United consistently even back last summer. Uh but he's yes. had another season at Bayer Leverkusen. Proven himself to be a very, very good player. Formerly of Man City and Celtic. I don't yeah. know if people knew that, but he used to play for Man City and Celtic, found a home at Bayer Leverkusen under the world's greatest coach, Xavi Alonso, who is unbeaten for the season. <laughs> you hate Xavi Alonso. I don't, <laughs> all I'm saying is, right, people think he's the greatest coach in the world. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's done very, very well with Leverkusen, but now he he's has. in line for all of the top jobs in the world and has a very, very small... Uh, ev evidence base and we're talking about Eric Ten Hag at the moment you know not proving enough he's won one league title like mm. fair, fair play to him and he should walk into whatever job he wants but it's just funny how if he has one bad season wherever he goes you know that he doesn't have the the resume of Ancelotti you know the, these kinds of people but on Frimpong he plays in a, like a right wing back, right midfield role position, and Man United yeah. have identified him as a potential right back. Those those are very different positions. They're very different positions. Mm. Is defense the strongest part of his game? We've been cussing Diogo Dallo for a long time for his defensive uh, deficiencies. Uh, but shiny new toy, Jeremy Frimpong. Yeah, this is why we do so much content on tactics because tactics matter because it's about buying players that help your tactics work and that you can go win football matches. So Frimpong's been on the radar for a long time. It's definitely one of the original kind of Ten Hag targets going back two years ago. But obviously his stock's grown massively now. And I think looking at what Leverkusen have done in this last year, you know, it's exploded now. He's everywhere. And obviously Leverkusen won the title the other day. Frimpong was absolutely on everything. You know, every, every interview was about him and screaming and shouting him on the the football pitch with the fans you know he's a very popular player uh and also a kind of life and soul player someone that that actually gets the idea of culture kind of says you know i'm gonna give my best every game and this is what i'm gonna do you look at man united scott you look from pom people again are kind of making the association he's a dutch international that there's kind of some correlation there with ten hag and and being completely honest with you i believe the opposite i don't believe that at all i think man united are looking at stock of players and you're also looking at that Dan Ash was already looking at that. Yes, he's not in the door. And he's looking at what can you do positionally to get players in that can help you do things. I think with Frimpom, you look at the, the right back position, look at both full back positions. Is that I don't think any of the full backs are nailed on for next year, Scott. And I include Luke Shaw in that, who is now back in training. I think that there's everyone that's going to be the jury is out. It's about what do you do? How do you build these full back positions? I think someone like Frimpom, he's got a release clause of, of around £40 million. Which is, which is cheap in the current market. He's definitely worth a lot more than 40 million. And there's this opportunity now to get him out of Leverkusen quite quickly and move him on. And obviously, bigger wage, bigger, bigger task at Man United than the Bundesliga. Is he the right player? I don't know. But Man United seem to think that he is. Man United look at him and think, yeah, this is the this is the modern fullback. You know, we always talk about those things: modern fullback, modern defensive midfielder, modern striker. This is the modern fullback in a way that I don't think you get the quality maybe out of Delo and wan -Bissaka completely. Do you know what I mean? Like, they've, they've, they've good players in their own merit sometimes, but they make mistakes, they make errors, they don't give you enough value going that way. And I think moving forward... Are we saying that Jeremy Frimpong isn't going to make mistakes and the tactical setup yeah. is the thing that is protecting him? He's got three defenders behind him. He'd get way. killed in an Eric Ten Hag system. Like he'd be, if he's at Man United now, he'd probably be called the worst right back in Europe. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he'd be part of the team because he'd done the most shots isn't, in isn't Europe. Isn't that the same case for the likes of Dallow? 
potentially. So you get to this. This is why it has to be left open ended a little bit, doesn't it? You have to look at the body of work. You have to go backwards to go forwards. So Frimpong's, you know, as you said, you called him shiny new toy. Absolutely, that's where you are with it. I think when you look at Man United, you need a much more structured way of getting the ball out from the back, from Anana, he starts with Anana, into your centre-backs and then into your full-backs and getting up the pitch and then inverting or either going wide. Frimpong gives you much more value on the front foot than even, say, someone like Delo, who supposedly is an attacking fullback, and certainly more than someone like wan who is, I think, a bit of a bobber job, you know, defensive fullback, but has got much better numbers going forward now than he's ever had, probably the best of his career in the last 12 months. But the question always has to be, does this player help you win a title? Does this player help you win every week? Does this player move you forward? And that's the question with Frimpom. United are going to look at players, Scott, in this price bracket, 40 million. They're going to be chopping in this supermarket for players because they don't want to go to the top end. They don't want to go 70, 80, 90 million. They want to start lower and work their way up. And I think United need a new fullback. Like, I really do believe it. And you might even then say, right, Frimpong got right back. And then everyone else fights for left back. That's it. You're all, you two can play left back, so you're going to fight for that position now. I'm talking about Wamba Saka and Delo, because you know Luke Shaw gets injured every three weeks. So you might look at that and go, "That's how you make that change." Do we know Luke Shaw will be there in next season? I'm sure he will be because he's one of the senior players that I think when he works, he does work. But Shaw working well with a Frimpong, that would be an upgrade in your fullback positions. But then you're going to have to upgrade the centre backs, aren't you? Because that's something that's really important to play out from the back and to be able to get the ball forward. Hmm. Interesting. What are you thinking? Hmm. Well, going, you need hmm. to upgrade at centre back, but we're judging a manager for not having centre backs that can pass. I think so, you need to upgrade almost in every position at Man United, almost. But there's also another take, Scott, to start the season when you and me were both saying, "Oh, we don't feel like that anymore." Like you've got you've got a stock of players that's really, really good. Well, suddenly now, twelve months on, that stock of players is not very good. You're like, okay, well, what do you do? What do you change? Will you change the tactics? So I think you do still need centre backs. Like, there's no doubt about it. Johnny Evans, Maguire, Lindelof, Varane, you could rip into every one of them, couldn't you, for some reason? You need to have steady centre backs. Not Johnny if... Evans. Don't, don't be mean to Johnny Evans. Um, only because of his age. Like, we all love Johnny, and I think Johnny's done well this season. It's really helped Man United massively since returning. And do you know what, Scott? Wouldn't be against another year, Johnny Evans, but six games only. Like As the I want fifth centre back. <laughs> the fifth <laughs> centre back. Literally the fifth centre back. And, and a leader, you know, someone. A dressing room guy, like they call it in the NBA, someone there who likes to talk and talk and keep people push people forward. You know, I want to see more minutes for Camboala, there's no doubt about it. You know, he made mistakes against Bournemouth, but that's what he has to do is to learn from his mistakes, get him in the team. But you do also need a senior centre back, don't you? You need someone to come in who who's going to be your centre back for like the next four, five, six years, and that you're going to stick with them and, and build that back line around them. The lot you've got at the moment, Scott, they're either too old, too slow, or too inconsistent in the or centre positions. Injured. Or too injured. But everyone's too injured. It's like it's boring, isn't it? It's like everyone's injured, so you just got to get on with it. 58 injuries now, I think, this season. That's insane. Which is mad. <laughs> but I, I also... Not the only club, though. You still know. get people saying to me, oh, it must be doctors. It must be... It might just be bad luck. It's just what it is. It's just you, you, these players, you, you might have to go and buy players that don't get as injured as well, don't have that injury record in them. Like a Varane, you bought him and you went, I might get injured there. That's what happened this year. He's actually been all right compared to other players. So you, I think you need to look at players like that. Actually, their availability is a really important thing. Bruno Fernandes, you know, elite availability, isn't he? He's always available. He's never injured, always plays. Uh, Scott McTominay, when he's injured, always comes back quicker than any human being I've ever seen. Like, be out for four weeks and he's back training in one week. And you're like, my God, it's like elite there in terms of the, the, the preparation and physicality. So I think with Frimpong, again, when you're buying a right back, Scott, you're buying across the board. You're not just looking at that one position. You're looking at how it fits with all the other positions. And do you know what? Anana deserves a back four that you can play the ball out to. <laughs> He deserves it because he hasn't got one. He hasn't had one. And it just looks terrible every time he has to clip it to someone and they lose the ball. And I put that on the current staff. I do, yeah. The, the, the players at the moment, Eric wants to maybe do that. But maybe he can't, you know. But a new, I think a new coach would protect Frimpong and allow him to go and play up the pitch. And that's how you would do it. Frimpong could go to Man City, Scott, tomorrow and be fine. He'd go to Man City and they would have the base around him to keep the ball and make sure that he plays up the higher up the pitch. And that's what Man United should be doing. That's the way it should go. You mentioned about how United need to spend 500 million, right? Yeah, we've... That was a throwaway comment. 
Yeah, I mean, well, I'm, I'm going to take it as as literal. <laughs> um, you said they needed to spend 500 million to compete, right? Maybe that's the case, but you just mentioned Frimpong there, 40 odd million. Mm -hmm. To Debo, linked, yeah. 40 odd yeah. million new center yeah. back players already. You yeah. start raising some money, you buy another player that is, let's say, nah, will Everton get relegated? I don't know. Onana, for, for example, if you can get, we all know their financial troubles. Can you get him for a knockdown price? You know, we, we spoke about Jared Branthwaite a few times on the show, and I know that he's the last section of the show today. Hmm. Priced out of a move for him. What, what's the quote? 80-ish? Yeah. I've always said, you don't need to spend... Let's stop making the mistake of spending 80 million quid on every, play, every player yeah. that you want. Like, there's value. You can go out there and find it. You might have to develop players, but if you can pick them up young, or pick them up around that price, 40, 50 million... Hmm. You're shaving off 30 million a pop, you know, it's not not spend 60 million on a 30 year old Casemiro who can't run, you know, mm -hmm. make smarter decisions, look at values of players, look at wages and structure deals properly. So you're not suffering like, yeah, I mean, I think there's smarter ways to go about it. And obviously Branthwaite is, is what I mentioned there. But yeah, tell us, uh, tell us what you want to say on uh, Jared Branthwaite's. I, I think the thing is with Branthwaite is that obviously the, the quote is 80 million and what we're hearing kind of from, from credible sources is that Manchester United are not going to play ball at that. They're not interested at that price range. They don't believe that that's something that they should do. And and it, it goes along the philosophy, Scott, what you've just said there about actually shopping in different markets. And we've done loads of content on that over the years and said that Man United should be looking down the food chains, kind of develop players and bring them in and combine it with youth. So that's why when I look at this and I kind of think, you know, just mentioned Camboala there, you know, I want Camboala to be a, a solid part of the project next season. I'm not saying he has to be the starter, but a solid part playing much more games he's played this year. I think he'll be ready. I think you've got 80 million and you, you, you know, we always talk about football budgets, right? And I always say football budgets are not real. They're, they're again, they're, they're, they're plastic, they're, they're elastic and you can do stuff with them. You can work with them. It's just more now about your FFP. I mean, if you're going to spend 80 million on a brand weight, to play left centre back, and that because that's where he plays, and that's what you want to do, doesn't make a lot of sense. Even though I think the player is brilliant, I really like Branthwaite, and I think he is someone that Man United should be keeping their eye on. But it doesn't work like that for me, Scott. Like if you're if you're looking at maybe a right centre back and a specialist, that was why before you know when Vardy o was on the market, and I was like, Vardy o's the kind of player you should go and get because he's he's affordable, and even at his price range, he was expensive but you could develop him into what you want. yeah. And City are now at that point with Vardiol. They've, they've taken a year, but they've developed him in now to a very, very good uh, defender who can give you upside the other end of the pitch. That's how you have to look at these signings, Scott. It has to be long-term. So if you're going to buy a centre-back, go buy, go get to, to Debo. Much more affordable, still a good age. Pair him up with Martinez, because you've got Martinez still. You've still got Luke Shaw at left-back. You're still going to have Juan Basaka at the football club. You're still going to have Delo at the football club. So you can mix and match and find a defence that works. And I'm not against United playing more three at the back, style football, 3-4-3, three, three, do something different. Do I think Eric Ten Hag will do that? Never, because he's never played 3-4-3 three, three in his life. So it's just, again, you need to look at those things with your squad and see what systems actually fit the squad. Someone like Frimpon would be able to drive you up the pitch, but you need control at centre-back. That's really, really important. So I think with Branthwaite, it's a no. It's a hard no at 80 million. And I don't think ever, and even if they get relegated, Scott, will be, will be doing any fire sales. No one needs to sell low. They don't. They, you just sell at the value, the market value. And yeah, you might forsake some parts of the deal or whatever. but. Bramfweight's going to go somewhere, I think, in the, in the summer for around that £80 million mark. There will be takers, even if it isn't Man United. Right, let us know everything. Well, let us know your thoughts in the comment section on anything that we've talked about today. There's been plenty to sink your teeth into. And get mm. in touch with us on social media as well, at double underscore Scott Saunders, at the score Rob underscore B, and at TPLMUFC as well please subscribe to the show on apple and spotify if you have not done so already the promise and a manchester united podcast is where you can find us just search those terms and obviously on youtube subscribe leave a comment hit the notification bell so you don't miss a show give us a five-star review on those audio platforms as well because uh, we like those and nice comments are always welcome as well rob we've been going to a lot longer than i anticipated yeah. today so we'll Go wrap long, it up it? there uh, <laughs> big thanks again we'll be back 
Friday, I believe. We will be, yeah. yeah End of the back week. Back on Friday. So plenty to sink your teeth into there. Made a mountain out of a molehill, really, because really, it wasn't much coming in, but we've still managed to squeeze an hour and five minutes out of it. Anyway, that's it from us today, from Scott and Rob. Until next time, this has been The Promised Land. Thank you very much for listening.